Fall in line, America. All out for the NBC War Bond Parade. Yes, forward march to victory, listeners, with more NBC stars in this seventh consecutive war bond parade. Yes, more stars. But look, you can see them coming from here. There's Raymond Massey, Nora Sterling, W.W. Chaplin, Dwight Kramer from The Right to Happiness, David Helm, and The Woman of America. That's the New York division. From Washington, Dr. I.Q. And from Chicago, Josephine Antoine and Reinhold Schmidt. Wait a minute. Who's that? Why, sure. From Hollywood, it's Kay Kaiser, Red Skelton, and Ronald Coleman. And the Grand Marshal of all, the man who gives the commands to start our marching, John W. Van Der Kook. Good morning and good evening. This is John W. Van de Cook, your parade starter, giving the command to Ari Nosco, our orchestra leader, to strike up the band. <laughs> present Raymond Massey, who played the leading role tonight in Cavalcade of America. He brings to our program a sense of the deep fellowship in arms and in a common destiny of our country and the British Commonwealth of Nations and all of the United Nations, which today march together under freedom's banner. Mr. Massey will read to us from the words of the great poet, whose words are the common heritage of all of us here and throughout the world, who speak the English tongue. From Shakespeare's King Richard II, he brings us the soliloquy of the dying Duke of Lancaster, John of Gaunt, Raymond Massey. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men Enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth who breathe their words in pain. Though Richard, my life's counsel would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear. Methinks I am a prophet new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. 
This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home, for Christian service and true chivalry, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation throughout the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with a triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame. Long ago, by an embittered and a dying man, were such prophecies of disaster mouthed. Yet, they did not see fulfillment. Then long ago, England survived a violent fever of internal strife. Just as today she has met and repelled threats of ruin and disaster from without. Then as today, a nation of free men clung stubbornly to freedom and won victory in her cause. Thank you, Raymond Massey for your distinguished interpretation of the John of Gaunt great soliloquy from Shakespeare's King Richard II. <laughs> and now to continue NBC's War Bond Parade, we sweep across country to Chicago, where Josephine Antoine, star of opera and of NBC's Contented Hour, is waiting with Percy Faith's orchestra to sing the jewel song from Faust. Ripo, 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 ripo
Thank you, Josephine Antoine, for bringing us the beautiful jewel song from Faust. We rejoin the parade with John W. Vandercook in New York. This is John W. Vandercook again. Our parade keeps marching onward. And coming past the reviewing stand now is Lieutenant Dwight Kramer from the Right to Happiness. That popular NBC drama heard every afternoon. A few short weeks ago, on a desolate, uninhabited island in the vast expanse of the Pacific, two tanned and bearded men, after an eternity on this island, they had reached with three other men after their ship was torpedoed, were rescued by an American submarine. Now the sub is nearing home. Tomorrow she reaches her west coast base. She moves easily, majestically along the darkened surface of the Pacific. Every hour, every minute, carrying her crew and the two rescued men closer to America. Lieutenant Dwight Kramer is standing on the sub-deck tonight, peering ahead into the darkness. The eternity of the desolate island during which it seemed that God and man alike had forgotten is now behind him. He is looking ahead, hoping to see the lights of his beloved country. Braced beside the conning tower, he is joined by Commander Babcock, the ship's captain. Hello, Kramer. Is that you, Kramer? Captain. See here, what's wrong? Not crying, are you? No, sir. No, I'm just thinking. It's a little hard to talk tonight. I'm all choked up. I know. I get the same feeling myself whenever we come into port. The whole crew does. They don't cheer, they don't laugh, they hardly even smile. They're just quiet. It's hard to realize we're almost home. All that time on the island, there wasn't much hope. Now, tomorrow, I'll be seeing my wife, my baby, mother and dad. I want to cheer and throw my hat in the air, yet somehow I can't. I keep thinking of the other three who were with us on the island. The three that aren't coming back. I know all that. Larry. He had a wife and a baby, too. He was so darn young. And Scotty. There was a girl waiting for him. And Timmy. Rough, tough little cockney from the docks of Liverpool. The Japs took all three of those fellows. Lord knows what's happened to them. It's tough to see your friends go. Tough. They let themselves be taken prisoners when the Japanese put ashore at our island to try and save us. My friend below deck and me. They may have died to save us. That's what gets me, Captain. How do people go about repaying the fellows that give up their lives for them? Only by keeping up the fight, Kramer. All of us. In the services and the people at home. Yes, I suppose. It sounds like so little. It needn't be only a little. Shouldn't be. You've been home several times since I was there, Captain. How are the people taking it? They're keeping up the fight, Kramer. They are. I'll stake everything I own. They aren't letting down. When you left home... Some people were complacent. You won't find that now. They used to feel the war could be won easily. They know that isn't so now. And men and women don't just shrug their shoulders and let someone else do the whole job when their brothers in arms are dying. Men don't stand by and let other men bleed to death without lifting a finger to help. 
No, Kramer. People at home aren't letting down. I think you'll be proud of your country. They'll keep up their part of this fight until this thing is over. Washington Division of our parade is coming into the picture now. The man with the questions and the answers has both the questions and the answers for you tonight. You know him well. Dr. I.Q., the command is to proceed with the business at hand. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't take a high I.Q. to understand what I have to say this evening. It needs only one qualification to understand this, and we all have that qualification. We're Americans. Suppose somebody stopped you on the street and said, How about it, Joe? Would you like to have this war last a couple of years longer? You'd think the man was insane. You'd say, Listen, I have a son over there and a brother and a lot of friends I've known a long time. The longer this war lasts, the less chance they have of coming back. Every day this war lasts, the less chance they've got. Well, now, how about it? If that's the way you feel... How about doing something to help get them back? Yes, you can shorten this war. Everyone today has that power. It's a little hard to believe, of course, but it's true. It's a little hard to believe that buying another war bond will shorten the war. But figure it this way. If everybody buys another, millions and millions of dollars more will be available for more planes and ships and munitions and supplies of every description. Extra muscle for the final smashing blow. Yes, that's if everybody buys another war bond. And remember, everybody starts with you. There it is, on the line. Do you want to help shorten this war? Sure you do. Then go to it. Buy that extra bond. Back to John W. Vandercook in Manhattan now, and the more to come of this war bond parade. The spotlight of our parade shines now on the kindly country philosopher, so beloved to so many of you who listen to him daily over NBC. Need I say that his name is David Harum? He has a few serious words to say to you. Hello, everybody. You know that this country of ours had plenty of growing pains. Or well, maybe not so many as other countries I can think of. And you know it happens that these growing pains sometimes result in war. It seems as though even the wisest leaders and the highest ideals just can't prevent it. I've been thinking a bit about that. <clears throat> And I find myself back in a year when this great country of ours is fighting another war. Not the one we're fighting now, but the one between the states. Well, there was a battle going on in that war. But still going on in this one. A battle against disease and infection. In them days, disease and plague just ran rampant through the armies. There wasn't no medicine then to prevent soldiers from getting sick. No medicine to cure them. You see, it wasn't just bullets that killed the boys in that war. It was disease. Well, that could be true today, too. Because our boys are fighting in the jungles, where it seems as though every little mosquito carries a special dreaded disease of his own. The heat on some of the fighting fronts is unbearable. Just the cold is so awful on others. But the difference is, we at least can do something about it. Yes, we can lend our money to the government so that they can go about buying the medicines that are needed so that our boys are given the best of care. So that they at least have a chance against his old enemy, disease and infection. Yes, this way, if we keep our boys safe from those enemies, <clears throat> they can concentrate on fighting the enemies who would destroy them with fire and shells. You know we can't never do enough for these men who are dying on the battlefields. What they're doing for us is so great we could never repay them. But doggone it, we can help them while they're doing it. And every American has got to do all that he possibly can. Because if he don't, he ain't an American. Back 
back to the shores of Lake Michigan. The NBC War Bond Parade continues from Chicago. Reinhold Schmidt, Basso, another contented hour star, joins NBC's War Bond Parade with Percy Faith and the orchestra to sing My Journey's End. Spread the brotherly love down here to the poor sinners before I get to call. Yes, the Lord, use the boss. Maybe this world ain't bad at all. I'll patiently wait till I get to call. I'll find a quiet. Thank you, Reinhold Schmidt. And now back to John W. Vandercook and the late news. This is John W. Vandercook once again, but this time not giving the commands, but bringing you the news. The news of the men on the fighting fronts for whom we are buying bonds. The Russian army has smashed into the suburbs of the manganese-rich city of Nikopal in the Lord Dnieper River and has five more of Adolf Hitler's crack divisions apparently caught in a trap. The Red Army is in control of the only railroad by which the Nazis might escape. Only 200 miles to the northwest, another Soviet army is wiping out whole regiments in the Sharkasi pocket. That other circle where 175,000 more Germans are being tightly pressed in a red vice. In Italy, American and British troops have today thrown back two more German counterattacks. But the Allies now admit that they were minor assaults. 
And there is this admission tonight from Washington. A member of the Allied High Command, an unnamed British officer, says that to a certain extent, the Germans are now taking the initiative south of Rome. Everything has not gone according to the book, he added. But it's not all lost either, although there has been some disappointment on the part of the Allies. The sharing of Paramashiro Island last Friday seems to have caught the enemy when his Japanese slant eyes were turned in another direction. This was the first visit our naval task forces have ever paid to one of the islands that form a chain, or perhaps a road that runs directly down to Japanese home islands. Perhaps the enemy garrisons believed that our first visit was long overdue, and hence they were lulled into some sense of false security. They were not caught off guard exactly, but quite literally when they had their eyes turned in another direction. That direction was toward the skies. But we have been fairly regular in our aerial operations against that most northern base of the Japanese home empire. It seems that when the star shells began to illuminate our targets... Jap gunners naturally turned their guns skyward to seek out the flights of bombers. And before they could train their sights down again to the level of the sea, from whence the ocean-borne tack had really come, the naval shells were already dropping among them. Some of the American warships dashed up to within five miles of the shoreline, which is close enough for very accurate fire, and also for a certain amount of direct visual observation by men aboard ship. They saw our shells hit one Japanese ship in harbor, type unknown. And they observed flames spurt up from burning buildings. The pyrotechnic display that ammunition and fuel dumps comes when they blow up. And then this American operation upon the Japs became even more distressing to the enemy. For after their sights were trained upon the ships at sea on the split second, our planes then did show up. We can be duly thankful that everyone's watches were set exactly. For by this brilliant bit of calculation, both the ships and the planes got away scot-free. There were no losses of American ships or American planes. The only comment at hand from Tokyo is this understatement, that this raid upon Paramushiro must, I quote, not be regarded lightly. Indeed, it must not. Linked with the establishment of our forces upon the Kwajalein Atoll, it is proof that although do we not know just where the Japanese main fleet may be, our own fleet is now large enough and strong enough to be in at least two places in the Pacific at once. And that's all just now. Bond Parade continues in just a moment. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Bye, War Bond. This is NBC's War Bond Parade. If you've been listening to Serenade to America these nights, you'll recognize one of NBC's newest and brightest personalities. I'd like to tell you a little story. Last summer, during the third war loan drive, there was a big rally at a baseball park near New York, and a little boy, let's call him Tucky Riley, had slipped in to watch the game. Tucky Riley, age seven, was the runt of his class. Nobody ever noticed Tucky, somehow. Some of the boys had fathers and brothers in the service to brag about. One had a knife with eight blades. One had a picture of Dizzy Dean. Only Tucky had nothing. And when the boys played games, mostly he just stood off a little way and watched. Today, after the game was over, there was a great excitement. All the balls that had been knocked into the bleachers were given back by the people that had caught them. The pitcher, one of the greatest in the league, autographed them, and then they were auctioned off. In that way, the bond quota was nearly reached. Nearly, but not quite. When everything had been sold, there was a lull. The crowd was waiting for something new to start the bidding again. 
But Tucky wasn't waiting. That thing in his pocket was a baseball signed by the great pitcher himself. And now, just wait till he showed that to the boys. As he ran out into the street, he bumped into a man. He was in a Marine's uniform, and he was tapping on the curb with his cane. Tucky knew about blind people, and so he steered him across the street. And as they walked, he told him about the ball, running the man's finger over the place where the name was. Say, that's great, said the Marine. Where'd you get it? Oh, there's some kind of a thing going on over in the ballpark, said Tucky. Something to get money for guns and stuff for the soldiers. The other folks gave their balls back, but I'm going to keep mine to... He stopped, looked up at the Marine. Say, he said finally, you got like that, your eyes, in the war, didn't you? The Marine nodded. Tucky was silent again, and then he said, Can you wait here for me, mister? I got to go and do something a minute. He walked back into the ballpark. The crowd was getting restless and beginning to break up, and the auctioneer out in the field was looking a little disappointed. Tucky walked out to him. His face was dirty and wet. Even the baseball was a little wet. But he handed it up to the man and said, Here, mister. The man grabbed it and shouted, Hey, folks, here's another autographed ball presented by... What's your name, kid? Tucky Riley, said Tucky. Presented by Tucky Riley. What am I bid? And the shouting. It seemed as if everybody in the park wanted to own that ball. One thousand, five thousand, fifteen thousand. The bids were coming from everywhere. Tucky walked away slowly. He supposed they were making a lot of money, and he was glad about that. But what he was really thinking of, he'd given away the only thing he'd ever had to brag about. He wasn't quite sure how he felt. But then when he got outside, there was the Marine waiting for him. He took him by the hand and led him down the street. Then he knew how he felt. He felt wonderful. Down the line of march now comes a woman of history, a woman of America. You hear Prudence Dane every day over NBC and a woman of America. The story of a woman whose courage and faith are the glorious heritage of all women of America today. I present Anne Seymour as Prudence Dane. Tomorrow morning, or perhaps sometime later during the day or the week, most of you will have a very special caller drop by at your home. I want to tell you something about him. I want to explain why he's coming to see you. He'll be a boy in his early or middle teens, this caller of yours. Nice American boy. He'll be friendly and courteous. I know you'll be the same with him. The chances are he'll be a little insistent, too, but there's a good reason. This caller of yours will be a boy scout. His assignment is to take your order for a war bond. All over this country, in almost every state and community in America, 1,600,000 Boy Scouts will be doing the same thing. These scouts are pitching in to help Uncle Sam put his fourth war loan drive over the top. They're going to help their country meet the quota and beat the quota. We can be proud of the spirit with which these scouts have volunteered to do this job. And of the way they're going about it, too. It's the same spirit which blessed their great-grandfathers who rode the wagon trains, curving westward across the plains and the lonely, hostile prairies. It's the spirit of courage, of enterprise, of pioneering. May I tell you what to expect when this Boy Scout drops by tomorrow or the next day? He'll bring with him an order blank for war bonds. He'll have spent hours, maybe days, walking from house to house. He will be seeking us out. He'll be delivering at our doorstep a very wonderful gift. An opportunity for us to help our men overseas. To save lives. To shorten this terrible war. From then on, it's up to us. Will we welcome him as a friend and send him away with thanks and with our order for another bond? Or will we close the door saying, let somebody else buy another war bond. Let George do it or Jack or Joe. I hope there's only one answer to that question. I know there's only one right answer. 
Give him your order for that extra bond. Get in step with that Boy Scout and make his march a parade to victory. This is John W. Vandercook again, starting the mechanics of a network, rolling by ordering the switch to Hollywood, and the command to Kay Kaiser, Red Skelton, and Ronald Coleman to take over this portion of our war bond parade. How about it, Hollywood? Are you ready? Well, hello, children. How are y'all? This is Kay Kaiser speaking from Hollywood. And right off the bat, the boys are all tuned up, ready to play that outstanding song for you, that really jumping and jiving arrangement we have of the pagan love song. One, and two, let's do it. <laughs> And now we're going to hear a few words from someone well-known to both movie and radio fans, that very fine actor and fine gentleman, Mr. Ronald Coleman. Ronald? Thank you, Kay Kaiser. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an extra war bond in my coat pocket because, well, even though you may have your weekly quota at home, when you're talking bonds, it's a mighty good feeling to have an extra one with you. By now, most of us know all the facts about war bonds. Long months ago, we learnt their arithmetic. How many 50 caliber bullets go into a $25 bond? How many hand grenades go into a $50 bond? And the amount of life-saving and fighting weapons that go into a $100 bond. But as a nation, we won't even be knee-deep in this war until every last one of us with a few dollars jingling in his pocket walks up to Uncle Sam and says, Here, Uncle, better use this money now so my family will be able to use it in the future. Honestly, we know that we owe this money, for we know that day after day and month after month of a long, vicious war, our men overseas have been piling up a debt we can never quite pay in full. Tarawa and Salerno and the little towns south of Rome are building a charge account upon America, where some men make part payment in something more precious than cash, and leave the balance for us to pay in easy installments of 1875 up. In Italy and the South Pacific, In the sky over Germany this very night, men are spending their lives so we may walk into our bank and buy a little chunk of freedom that, like our bonds, will still be good ten years from tonight. When we buy a war bond, we're paying the price of admission to the biggest show on earth and buying a seat in the section marked Reserved for Free People. This war bond in my pocket is the finest bargain in the world. Thank you. Now, now I'd like to introduce to you one of our most popular comedians, a young man whose amusing expressions have become a part of our everyday talk. One of them was headlined on a very important occasion, the bombing of Tokyo when Doolittle Doodit. 
This versatile young man has a number of interesting aliases. Clem, Junior, Jane Newton Numskull, Willie Lump Lump, and more recently, Bolivar Shagnasty. I refer, of course, to Red Skelton. <laughs> Hello, chillin. How are you? <laughs> so many people have requested that uh, we do the save and sew sketch. Uh, sketch. Uh, I think tonight would be a swell time to do it and to point out that the finest tailoring in the world is done by mothers at home. They make something over for the youngsters. So, Harriet Hilliard, you be my mother, and I'll be the mean little kid who needs a new suit. <laughs> Sliding down the banister, I came across a sliver. With me pants, I did a dance called the cold breeze, made me shiver. Later, I help I come on. I will help I come. Hey, Mom, Mommy, hey, Pop, go knock on, take me cowbell off. Yes, dear. Oh, boy, I feel good to get that cowbell off. Hey, Mommy, why does I have to wear a cowbell when Pop is home? Well, because we like to talk freely. You know too much already. Oh. <laughs> hey, m- Mom, can, uh, can I go down to the candy store and get me a jawbreaker before they sell her quota for the day? Uh? <laughs> I'm sorry, dear. Mother doesn't have a penny to give you. No, I'm in a chip. Look, look, 50 cents. Look, 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 look. Where look. did you get that? Well, it's one you didn't find when you were going through Pop's pockets when he was asleep. Junior. <laughs> I don't go through your father's pockets when he's asleep. Okay, boy, you better be careful, though. Pop says he's going to put a mousetrap on his pants, you know. Hey, Mommy, what you finger bandaged up for? Stop asking silly questions. Oh, did you get you with a finger caught in a mouth? <laughs> no, I didn't. It was a bear trap. Whoa, look like Pop took me suggestion after all. <laughs> well, I still don't see how I missed that half a dollar. Well, it wasn't in a suit he was wearing. It was one hanging in the closet, you know. Look how black the fire made it. Look, look. What fire? Well, uh, Pop says I found a half a dollar in his suit. I could have it, you know. What fire, Junior? Well, I'm going to tell you. Good enough. <laughs> Don't yell at me. Put that shillelagh down, girl. <laughs> uh, I was in too big a hurry to look through the pocket, so I burned up all the suits and then scraped the ashes for the half a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Junior, you're kidding me. <laughs> oh, you just keep laughing, that's all. <laughs> Why don't you put in an order with that doctor who sold me to you and you could pay for him in ten years with the war bond money? You know, it seems a shame that all these clothes you're making for me go to waste around here. Oh, Junior, please. We could use another baby, you know. Heaven knows there's enough spankings around here for two <laughs> Hey, can I get down now? Can now, I get down? Now, don't be so fidgety. Well, I'm tired standing here. I sit on the back of the chair until you was ready. Don't do that. It'll tip over with you. No! Oh, it broke me with a skull. It broke me with a You didn't break your skull. I better put a dent in it. Stop putting dents in your head. It's hard enough now to get hats to fit you. Yeah. Ooh. Now stand still and you won't get hurt. Okay. Where's my needle? I saw it in the basket. It's here somewhere. Oh, oh I found it here. Well, pull it out of me fingers. Oh, look. Didn't draw blood. Well, maybe I ain't got none. Maybe I... Let me finger her. Oh, all right. Here, let me kiss it. Okay. Now. It's oh, well. well. It's all well. It's all well. Hi. It's dark in here. I can't see to thread the needle. Okay. Junior, your fingers are smaller than mine. Pull the thread through the needle, will oh, you? Okay, well, hold it down. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Don't look at it so close. You get cross-eyed. Cross-eyed? Is that why there's two needles instead of one? <laughs> Junior, stop that. I ain't doing nothing. But look at your eyes. I can't. My nose is in the way. <laughs> hey, look, Mommy, your sister is here. Oh, well, the only way to straighten them is to tap you on the back of the head. Okay, good. Yeah. Straighten them. Don't knock them out. <laughs> Now, here, hold this material around your waist while I sew it together. Here, like this, like this. No, no, not up under your well, chin. That's the way I like me pants. And then when I eat, I don't need a bib. I just tuck me pants in my collar. Stand still. If I accidentally stick you with a pin, you'll listen to me. You stick me with a pin, you'll listen to me. Or... Then I'll stand still while I trim the legs. Oh, no, no, don't trim me legs. I short enough now. Not your legs, the pants legs. Oh, boy, for a minute I could see myself you sitting on a cigarette paper, swinging me feet. Pick your brand, you know. Pick your brand. Pick your brand. He's silly. Mm. Now, now the other leg. Yeah, now, now the other leg. Yeah. There. Yeah. That's funny. They're longer in the back than they are in the front. Maybe I shouldn't have leaned over to watch you, huh? <laughs> now, if I even them up, they're going to be too short. You know, well, even uh, leave them like that. Leave them like that. I can walk over around and stoop over like that. Anybody say, what's the matter? Kid, I say, just looking for something. Kid, just looking for something. Well, maybe they won't be too short. I'll try it. Okay. And don't bend over. I won't. I won't. I wouldn't do that, boy. You knock me head off. There. 
Now the back part's higher than the front. Junior, I told you not to bend over. Don't you hit me. I didn't bend over. I leaned back that time. Oh, I give up. I'm not going to try again. Oh, why are you closing the sewing machine? Ain't you going to make me something to wear? Yes, darling. I'll make you something to wear just as soon as I I fold the material. I don't like that gleaming. Here, now lie down on the library table. No, no, no. There, now. Lie down. Hold your feet up in the air. No, no. Now, one, two, three. Now, get down. Now, maybe that'll teach you to stand up straight. Well, what's the matter? Don't you like your new pants? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. They're very nice. They're very nice. But don't you think I'm a little big for the diaper style? (laughs) 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 Thank you, Red. Thank you, Harriet. And now, here's a melody which has been voted most likely to endure a long musician's row. It's a bit of sweetness and light put together by Sergeant Davy Rose. A story of a group of violins who went off on a spree. And without any strings at all, we'll play Holiday for Springs. is all important these days, but how the news is interpreted is even more important. The men of your morning world news roundup, W.W. W. Chaplin. Good morning. To the east, anyway. Good evening to the west. That hasty Jap report that our fighting men had actually landed on Paramashiro in the North Pacific Kuros was apparently a phony. The Japs seemingly didn't know just what had happened there, so they took a flyer. They went on a fishing expedition. They announced that we had actually landed in the Kurils, hoping that we'd be startled into giving them the real news. Well, by now, I guess, they found out from their own rattled folks that it wasn't invasion. Just preparation for invasion. That will come, but only when we're ready. Then it's reasonable to believe we'll take Paramashiro the way we took Kwajalein and the Marshals. And Paramashiro is only a little more than half as far from Tokyo as is Kwajalein within the range of our big bombers. 
While we're mentioning the marshals, Kwajalein, the Navy told the story of the cost of that invasion today. It cost the lives of 286 American men. A heavy loss. The life of one American, one allied fighting man, would be a heavy loss. But against that loss of 286 Americans, the Navy tells us, against that is the fact that 8,122 Japanese were killed. 29 Japs died on that palm-covered coral island for every American killed in the battle there. In Russia tonight, one of the worst disasters of the war stares the Nazi high command right smack in the face. It isn't only the threatened encirclement of tens of thousands of troops, the annihilation of those troops in the Dnieper Bend. Rather, it's the report by the Russian army tonight that in this same operation in the Ukraine, it's entered the city of Nikopol. For from that city and its suburbs, the Nazis have been getting a vital supply of manganese. Half of all the manganese used to build the German war machines. And without that vital alloy, German production of high-grade steel will be seriously crippled. In Italy today, Allied troops repulsed two more German counter-assaults on the invasion beachhead south of Rome. Dispatches say that the attacks were relatively minor. The Germans are apparently just practicing up for their Sunday punch. The all-out attempt to drive our troops back into the sea. In Washington, that member of the Allied High Command that Mr. Van der Cook told us about had some sobering words to say about the situation. They are on that beachhead below Rome. This man, whom I'm permitted to identify only as a British officer, says the Anglo-American forces on the bridgehead, to a certain extent, have been losing the initiative. He says everything has not gone by the book, according to plan. But there's this consolation, that all is not lost either. And that's the news as of right now. Yes, our war bond parade is over. But before we leave, I'd like to tell you about tomorrow night's war bond show. It's not a parade, but an attack. Yes, an attack on all the enemies of this war bond drive. The stars of this broadcast, well, ladies and gentlemen, the stars are the greatest stars ever to be heard on the radio. For they are you. Yes, the stars are the people of these United States. And you'll hear them from all over the country. Don't miss it. Thank you, John. Tonight's parade included from Chicago, Josephine Antoine and Reinhold Schmidt. From Washington, Jim McLean, our Dr. IQ. From Hollywood, Kay Kaiser, Red Skelton, and Ronald Coleman. Our New York stars were Raymond Massey, Nora Sterling, W.W. W. Chaplin, David Gothard as Dwight Kramer from The Right to Happiness, Craig McDonald as David Harum, and Anne Seymour as Prudence Stain from Woman of America. Your master of ceremonies, John Vandercook. We'd like to thank all who made tonight's broadcast possible. The artists, the sponsors, their advertising agencies the American Federation of Radio Artists, and the American Federation of Musicians. NBC and its independent affiliated stations are proud to have participated. Don't forget, tomorrow night at the same time, an hour and a half war bond show. Until then, Ben Grauer, your announcer, makes this suggestion. Buy a bond, strike a blow for freedom. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Bye. Bye. Bye.